Take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you're not already there. And in just a moment, we'll look at the Word of God there. Verses 16, 17, and 18. When Don and I were in college, the first year and a half I was there, I, I went to Union my junior year, and so it was a year and a half, right in the middle of my senior year before we started dating. But before that, uh, Donna had a young preacher guy, and I won't call his name. <laughs> You'll understand why in just a minute. But uh, uh, he came up to her, this is before Donna and I really knew each other, and he told Donna, he said, the Lord has told me that it is his will for us to get married, him and Donna. And just like that, she said, well, when he tells me something, I'll let you know, all right? <laughs> and obviously, <laughs> it was not God who told him that. Sometimes we just don't know the will of God, do we? I'll talk to somebody back here, I guess. All right. Sometimes <laughs> we just don't know the will of God, do we? Well, I got the same answer there. Let me try it again. Sometimes, no, let me ask the question. You'd say amen to anything right now. Sometimes we don't know the will of God, do we? Yes, no, we don't. Sometimes I don't know what to do. I pray and still sometimes I just, I don't know sometimes what the will of God is. And you need to be real careful when somebody else tells you the will of God for you. They might have it right, they might not. You be real careful with that. I will tell you that if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I can guarantee you it is the will of God for you to be saved today. You say, where do you get that? Glad you asked. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. This is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and Savior who desires all men, all people, is what he's talking about there, to be saved. Now, by the way, I hope that is in your theology. I hope that you know that God loves everybody, Jesus died for everybody, and anybody can be saved. A, who, a whosoever will, salvation. He desires all men to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. Same thing in 2 Peter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slow about His promise. As some count slowness or consider slowness. But is patient toward you. Not wishing for any to perish. But for all. He says it positively. He says it negatively. Not for, he, God doesn't want anybody to perish. But He wants everyone to come to repentance. Now, everybody doesn't come to repentance because God's will is not always done. It is not the will of God for somebody to murder somebody. It is not the will of God for somebody to have an abortion. It is not the will of God for two people of the same sex to be married. It is not the will of God for you and me to tell a lie. It is not the will of God for us to be immoral. It is not the will of God for us to do a lot of the things that we do. Sometimes things happen that are not the will of God. But when you get saved, that's the will of God. He wants you to be saved. And once you become a Christian, God has a purpose and a will for your life. And one of those things, I don't know everything that He wants for you, but I know that for every Christian, He wants us to mature in Christ's likeness. One of my favorite verses is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, but grow in grace. I like that, grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to Him be the glory. He just, Peter can't even talk about Jesus without breaking out in worship and doxology. He says, both now and forever, to the day of eternity, amen. Knowing God's will can be hard sometimes. It's, it's just difficult. I mean, who do you marry? He said, well, I'm going to marry the best looking one. Well, it's amazing what a few decades will do to somebody's looks. Can I have an amen in the house of God? 
I looked in the mirror the other day and I wanted to introduce myself to myself. I didn't know who I was. You know, when you think about yourself, you think back there when you were shaped like a light bulb and now you're kind of shaped like a pear, you know, and it's just kind of different. Y'all will get that in a minute. But uh, so who should you marry? Not just looks. Well, you better get somebody that's got a good heart for the Lord. And even then, who do you marry? God has to show you that. And he will. What job do you take? Where do you live? I'm telling you, it's amazing to me. I have talked to people and said, well, we're, we're getting a raise, so it must be the will of God. I want to say this to you. Just because you're getting a raise to move somewhere else, to move your family somewhere else, that might not be the will of God. That might be a test from God. God doesn't just work by, oh, if there's more money in it, it must be God. Oh, if they're pretty, they must be the one God wants me to have. I got news for you. God doesn't see as man sees. God looks on the heart of the matter, not just on the peripheral and on the outside. Where should you live? That's a big deal, guys. Oh, I'll just live in the most economical... What if, there, what if you buy a house and you got the wrong place and there's somebody next door that you don't want influencing your kids? What if you go to a town and you don't want your kids in these schools because there are people there? I'm just telling you, you need to walk with God. You need to stay close to God. You need to sto- stay close and clean to God so you can hear his voice. But I want to assure you after having said all that, that I do know the will of God for every Christian in the world today because of three things that are said in three verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul was writing to one of his favorite churches. You can read about this church in Acts chapter 17. Paul went there, went to the synagogue, preached, people got saved, started a church, and as usual, he got run out of town. Went to Berea from there. He had been in Philippi before that, Thessalonica. And they don't call it Thessalonica. When you go over there, I've been there twice, they call it Thessaloniki, all right? But forget all that, we're in Memphis. It's Thessalonica here and they're the Thessalonians. Paul was writing to them, and he wanted to write a long letter, but Paul would get in a hurry sometimes, and what he did, he had an outline, it looks like, that the Holy Spirit had given him to write about, all these points, and when he ran out of time with his letter in several letters that he wrote in these epistles, he would just start hitting the points, and that's what he's doing at the end of First. Thessalonians. He has a lot more to say. He probably had as much to say as all the 16 chapters of 1 Corinthians, but he only did five chapters to the Thessalonians. Not that he loved them less, but he just ran out of time. And so he just starts popping little commandments all through there, and we get three of them, and he covers it up saying these three things, these three commandments little simple commandments in the sense of just short verses there, but they are powerful. These are the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. He he labels that. He nails that on these three. Now, all of them are the will of God, but he nails it and says, this is God's will. Look at it with me very quickly. We're in the middle of just this machine gun shooting these commands at us, and we come to verse 16. Rejoice always. Say that out loud. Next verse. You said that was it? Yeah. If you want a good memory verse this week, there it is. Anybody can do that one, all right? Pray without ceasing. Say that. There's, now you can memorize two, right? And then in everything give thanks. Say that. Now, why does he say, notice what he says. Notice the prepositional phrase he concludes with. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. There's no question, is it? There's no question. What's God's will for me? I don't know everything, but I know this. 
I know that He wants you to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything to give thanks. It is the will of God. Now, you know what? As a preacher, I thank God for easy outlines. Okay? Amen? <laughs> you, you don't have to go to seminary to get this outline, all right? Here it is. This is God's will for you. Number one, it is God's will for you to rejoice. Again, verse 16, rejoice always, latter part of verse 18, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The word for rejoice is Cairo, rejoice, be glad. Same word that we find many times in the New Testament. It refers, for instance, to the wise men when they saw the star above Bethlehem, they rejoiced. Matthew 2, verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They were leaving Herod's temple, and they were going to Bethlehem, and they saw the star again, and they rejoiced. They exuded with gladness because they were being guided by the hand and the ways of Almighty God, leading them to His will. Don't you wish there was always a star right in front of the will of God? (laughs) That'd make it a little bit easier, wouldn't it? Now, on on another note, this word, Cairo, is also used by Jesus when He said these strange words in a beatitude. Jesus said, blessed are you when men or people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now listen, rejoice. When people come against you because you're a Christian, don't bow up. Don't try to defend yourself. Just say, I'll I'll be right back. Go in a closet, shut the door and say, hallelujah. They're talking about me because I love Jesus. I must be going in the right direction because I'm running into the devil. Amen. If you never run into the devil, you're walking with him. Amen. You walk with Jesus. You please Jesus. He's going to send somebody your way that doesn't like what you're doing. I'll guarantee it. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He said, Brother Steve, I don't want any treasure in heaven. I want it now. I got news for you. The stuff you have now, it's not going to last. It's going to rot. It's going to rust. It's going to have mold on it. All this stuff down here, it's nothing. But when you start pleasing God and you start laying up treasure in heaven, even when you're persecuted, that's treasure in heaven. When you're persecuted for righteousness sake, you ought to just say, praise the Lord. I am in good company. I'm right there with those disciples in Acts chapter 5 who had been beaten because they preached the gospel of Jesus in Jerusalem against the Sanhedrin's will. And the Bible says when they left, they were bleeding and they were bloody, but they were rejoicing. They said, it says, so they went on their way from the presence of the council, that's the Jewish Sanhedrin where they had been beaten, and they were rejoicing, Cairo, that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Would you rejoice if, 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 if they came in here today and said, okay, all of y'all line up, we're going to just beat the tar out of you, and we're just going to whip you and make you bloody, would you leave Bellevue today and go to your car and say, hallelujah, I've been chosen to be persecuted for the sake of Jesus Christ. Do you know that there are people all over the world that are imprisoned right now because they're doing what I'm doing right this very second? Do you understand that we live in a world that persecutes Christians more than ever before in anywhere else, any other time in the world? Do you understand that it could come here? I'm not trying to frighten you. I'm just trying to say, look, man, this world is no friend of Jesus Christ, and this world is no friend of the followers of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, when you get to the point that you're like, The old prophets, when you're like Jeremiah, they got persecuted all the time. When you're like Ezekiel, when you're like Elijah and Elisha 
And you're like these godly people in the Old Testament and the New. When you're like Peter that got thrown into prison, when you're like James that got killed by the sword, when you're like Stephen that got stoned to death, when you are like these people, when you're like John that got arrested and put on the island of Patmos, will you rejoice? Will you rejoice that you've been counted worthy to suffer shame for my name? That's strong stuff. Strong stuff. And then the Bible says this word is used in the famous, probably the most, one of the most famous parables Jesus ever told, the one of the prodigal son. The prodigal son went off in the distant country and realized that the world was a lot meaner than his father's house. And he came back to his father and the father was looking every day, He'd go out and look and see if his boy was coming back. And one day he saw him coming back and he ran and he embraced him. He kissed him. He hugged him. He put his robe on him and he brought him back in the family. And the other brother who had not left on gone off, he had stayed with the father. He got mad. He's like a church member that gets mad because the the church makes a lot of noise about somebody getting saved that they don't particularly like. And so this this guy is is saying to his father, he said, I've never done anything wrong. I I haven't committed immorality. I've never left you. I've never squandered your money. He's done all of this, and he gets saved or whatever and comes back here, and you throw a party for him. You never thrown a party for me. You kill a lamb for him. You never killed a lamb for me. We're having all this big party, and I've never had anything. Well, bless your little heart. And the father says, son, everything I have is yours. You've always been with me. Is that not enough? Then notice what the father said. We had to celebrate and Cairo rejoice. For this brothers of your brother of yours was dead. He's begun to live again. He was lost. He's been found. Can you imagine having a child to die and then them come back from the dead and live again? Wouldn't you rejoice? Can you imagine a child to be abducted or to be lost and all of a sudden they're found? Do you think you would say, well, I thought you'd show up. No, man, you'd be saying, praise God. And so this father is saying, when somebody gets saved, when a prodigal returns, the dead have come to life and the lost have been found. And son, I can't help it. I just got to rejoice. That's the word used here. And you say, where does that joy come from? From the indwelling Holy Spirit. Joy comes from the fruit of the Spirit. It is part of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Spirit-filled Christians have joy. It's not happiness. Now, let me just say this before I move on to the next point. Joy and happiness, totally different because they come from two different places. Happiness, think about the word. What is the root word? Happen. What happens in life determines whether or not you're happy or sad, right? If something good happens, you're happy. But if something bad happens, you're not happy. You're sad. So everything to do with happiness That's worldly stuff. Nothing wrong with being happy. I'm not saying it's sinful to be happy, but it's all based on what happens. So so it's not determined by God so much. It's determined by what's happening out here. And so if good things are happening, if all the things are going right for me, if my job's going right, family's going right, marriage is going right, kids are doing great, and money's coming in, I'm happy, happy, happy. But if things start going south, I get sad. But joy is not like that. Joy doesn't come from happenings. Joy comes from knowing who Jesus Christ is. 
And it never changes because he is immutable. He never changes. That's what immutable means. And so Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So no matter what happens, I may not be happy, but praise God, I can have the fruit of the Spirit. I can have joy. I can have joy and still have a tear in my eye. I can have joy even when I don't understand what's going on. It is joy unspeakable, full of glory. It is supernatural, and it is a precious part of the fruit of the Holy Ghost of God. Do you have that joy? Doesn't matter what's happening. Doesn't matter what's going on outside, I can still have joy, regardless of who is in the White House, regardless of what the economy is doing, regardless of what is going on in any area, regardless of what's happening in my family or vocationally or educationally or whatever, I know that because of Jesus, there is a bloody cross where I can have my sins forgiven. There is an empty tomb that promised me, promises me that I'll never die. But when I die, I won't die. I'll go to heaven. And there is an occupied throne. And Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. And I will have joy in Jesus Christ. I'm trying to talk conversationally, but I'm telling you, it's hard when you talk about rejoicing. Amen? Amen. If I holler and hoop, I'm not mad. I just love to talk about things like joy. Well, I know it's God's will for you and for me as Christians to rejoice. And by the way, how many of you like to be around joyful people? Anybody out there? I'm telling you what's right, man. Some of these folks out here will just... They'll pull the life out of you, won't they? Well, how you doing? Well, it's, I'm doing best I can. Uh, things are tough, man, I tell you what. Man, get your mind off of yourself and get your mind on Jesus and think about all the good things He's done for you and get some joy back in your heart and quit being such a down and outer all the time, all right? God bless you. I just gave you a gift, all right? <laughs> Whether you want to receive it or not. Quit being down all the time. Focus on Jesus, not all these happenings. Focus on Jesus and get your joy back. Get your joy back. All right. It's God's will for you to rejoice. It's God's will for you to pray. Look at verse 17. Pray without ceasing. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, verse 18. It's God's will for every Christian to pray. Prayer is verbal communion with God, intimate communion with God. And did you know that when you pray, the whole Trinity is involved? Hey, look at me. I'm going to give you a verse, but look at me. When you pray, here's what you're doing. It involves the whole Trinity. You're talking to the Father, and you come to Him through the Son, Jesus Christ, and you come to Him, the Father, through the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll show you the verse, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, for through Him, through Jesus, we both have our access in one Spirit that is in the power of the Spirit, to the Father. So, through Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to talk with my heavenly Father, and that is God. Now you say, well, Brother Steve, I don't know how to pray. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You say, no, I don't. Yes, you do. Don't ever say that again. Jesus told you how. In what we call the Lord's Prayer. All you, look, Don and I, we hold hands every day and pray this prayer together. We pray it out loud, and it's wonderful to pray it out loud. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We prayed it this morning. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We don't do it this fast, but I'm doing it because of y'all, all right? 
Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Pray that every day. And that's good. But it's not just a prayer to be prayed. It's a prayer to give you guidelines for prayer. It shows you every, every important aspect of prayer. Let me break it down for you very quickly. Write this down, if you will. It'll help you. First of all, it includes the very most important, the first prayer, and that is the prayers of praise. Prayers of praise. If you go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus said, pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, what's this name thing? What's that all about? There are dozens and dozens and dozens of names ascribed in the Old and the New Testament to the same God. And what they're like, I like to look at them this way. If you've ever taken a diamond, you can put a diamond and shine a light on it. And if you slowly turn it, you'll see all kinds of different colors in that diamond. You'll see all dis- different aspects of that diamond. There are just so many, hundreds of them. You'll just see it as you turn that diamond. I remember, I don't have any, I don't have a diamond that I know of for me, but I, I remember buying Donna's diamond ring and that jeweler put it in the light and just turned it like that slowly. And I saw all these different colors and hues and all that. It was just beautiful. That's what the names of God are. They manifest to you the character of God. That's what the names of God do. And so they're, they're, they're perfect for praying. I mean, they're, they're just prayer made. And when he says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, glorious, blessed be your name. You can take the names of God. I'll just give you eight of them. You won't have time to write them all. You can come back and look. All of our sermons are free. You don't have to pay for anything, all right? Just look online. First of all, I, I pray these eight every day. I pray others besides this, but I praise God that He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. I've got about 45, 50 people I pray for every day to be healed. I'm praying for Mac every day. Praise you, God, that you're Jehovah Rapha. And I believe he heals with medicine, miracle, or both. I praise you that you're Jehovah Jireh. You're the Lord, my provider. Most of the time that means he's going to give you a job. He's not going to just give you a handout. He's going to give you a job. Lord, I praise you that you provide for me, for my family. Lord, I praise you that you are Jehovah Nisi, the Lord who fights for me while I keep silent. I praise you that you are Jehovah Rohi, and I'll, you are the Lord my shepherd. Dear God, I thank you. The Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I just pray that to God every day. You make me to lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside the still waters. And I pray that text over in John chapter 10. I'm one of your sheep. I hear your voice. You know me. I follow you. You give eternal life to me. I will never perish. No one will snatch me out of your hand. Every day you can just pray the names of God and the verses that go with them. Jehovah Shalom, aren't you glad that the Lord is your peace? Aren't you glad that you can have peace that passes all understanding? When everybody else is all tight and all messed up and all worried, you can have peace that passes all understanding. Aren't you glad that God is Jehovah Shammah, the Lord who is with us? He is present with us. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. Aren't you glad that He's Jehovah Sidkenu? He is our righteousness. My righteousness is like filthy rags, but Jesus' righteousness is perfect. And when I come before Him, I praise Him that He's Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord my righteousness, and Jehovah Makadesh, who sanctifies me, who not only saves me, but sets me apart from all the people to be His and makes me daily more like Jesus Oh, I praise you, Lord. Hallowed be your name. So that's one, that's the way to start. That's how you start your prayers. And then a prayer of surrender. Next in the Lord's Prayer, he says in Matthew 6 10, Your kingdom come, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you haven't prayed that today, even if you have, let's pray it again. I prayed it earlier this morning. Put it back on the screen. Let's all pray that right now. That's a big prayer right now, a prayer of surrender. Pray it with me right now. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many of you want to see the will of God done in your life? Amen? Then pray for it. Pray for it and say, Lord, whatever you want whatever you want. I was reading this little, this morning in 1 Samuel 3, when God was speaking to Samuel, he was a little boy. He was there at Shiloh at the tent of meeting. 
And he thought it was Eli, the high priest. The Lord was saying, Samuel, he kept going back. And finally, Eli said, it's the Lord. Next time he says that to you, just say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening, which means, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And that's what happened. And little Samuel said, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. And God called that little boy. God, if we would say, saved that little boy right there. And he became a great man of God. And by the way, I am praying for God to raise up a national prophet like Samuel in America. I read this morning at the end of chapter 3 in 1 Samuel, it says that everybody from the north and Dan to the south in Beersheba knew that he was a prophet and everything that came out of his mouth did not fall to the ground literally. That is, it came to, to be. Don't you think we need a prophet like that in America today? We sure do. I'm praying for that. I'm praying for God to raise up somebody just like Samuel. But he was a man who listened to God and he surrendered to God. Just like Jesus Father, if there's any way this cup can pass for me, not my will, but thine be done. Prayers of surrender. Prayers of petition. This is where you're asking God to meet your needs. If you've got a need, start praying about it. Sure, you can work and everything else, but don't manipulate. Just pray. And then do what God says. Matthew 6, 11, give us this day our daily bread. You can ask for all kinds of things. Jesus later says in chapter 7, in, uh, in, uh, maybe it's chapter 8 in uh, no, it's chapter 7 in uh, Matthew. He says, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it, sh you, it shall be opened to you. God wants you to ask. God wants you to seek and to find. Prayers of petition. Prayers of forgiveness. Ask God to forgive you and then ask Him to help you forgive people who have wronged you. That's what Matthew 6, 12 is all about. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Pray every day that God will forgive you for sins you commit doesn't make you keep your salvation, but it makes you stay closer to God in your fellowship with Him. And then pray for prayers of protection. This is big for me. I pray, I pray for protection over this church. I pray for protection over our ministries. I pray for protection over my family. I pray protection. I'm really praying this week because they're all coming in starting tomorrow. There's going to be 10 adults and 15 grandbabies. Y'all pray. I'm praying for protection. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil one. That's what it is. A definite article is there. Every day I pray a verse out of Psalm 91, two verses, verses 10 and 11. Lord, I pray that no evil will befall us, no plague will come near our dwelling. Give your angels charge concerning us to guard us in all of your ways. Don't you thank God for the angels of God, the protection of God? Oh, I want Him to be a a shield about me and mine. And then I'm going to go out of the prayer closet the way I came in. I'm going to keep praising in prayers of praise one more time. I went in that way. I'm going out that way. Matthew 13 says, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's praising God. And then I'm going to end with one more prayer. And boy, don't ever forget this one. And that is the prayer of agreement. The prayer of agreement. Do you know the devil is the great divider God is the great unifier. He wants us to agree, even in prayer. Jesus said, well, let me give you the, the, the verse real quick. It's just the last verse, the last word in Matthew 6, 13, amen. Everybody say it out loud. Amen. Amen. What does that mean? So be it. I agree. Amen. If you're old enough to remember the late 60s, right on. <laughs> There's a blast from the past. All right. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 19, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything, the word is symphonos. If you're in symphony with one another, if you're together in your hearts, that's what a symphony is. It's all these instruments not playing their own thing, but everybody playing their part so that it all sounds like one. If you're in symphony, if you agree with one another on earth, Anything you may ask, it shall be done for you by my Father who is in heaven. And I want to stop and say something. Time out. Are you listening? I'm not going to keep preaching if you're not. Are you listening? I'm, I'm being as serious as I can be. God is calling people to pray and to be watchmen on the wall for the United States of America. 
Everybody won't say yes, but God is calling out a remnant. God is calling out watchmen. And I just want to read to you what I believe God is doing. This is not on the screens, but I, if, you, if you want to go home and study some real Scripture about prayer, it's Isaiah 62, verses eight, uh, 6 and 7. Isaiah 62, 6 and 7. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night, they will never keep silent. You who remind God, that's what prayer is. We're rem- not, that he thought, he, not that He doesn't know, not that He has to be reminded, but that's a, a beautiful way of saying our prayers. Were, Lord, we're just reminding you what we're doing. Is we're praying your promises back to you. You promised us this. We're reminding you of your promises. You who remind God, take no rest for yourself. Don't ever let up praying. Don't stop praying and give Him no rest. I love that. Don't give God any rest. Not that He ever would take it, but don't, you, I mean, just wear Him out. I mean, just go to Him. Be like Jacob at Peniel down at the Jabbok River and say, God, I'm latching on to you. I will not let you go until you bless me. I'm going to wear you out, God. Not in the way of, I'm not talking about spanking God. I'm just saying, don't let go. Just, just stay in there. Give Him no rest until He establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Amen. I believe God's got prayer warriors all over this world and all over this nation. And I want to tell you, prayer is where the action is. And I want to be in on it. I want to be an intercessor. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear It is God's will for you to pray. Now, as usual, like Paul, you remember Paul in Thessalonians had all these commands. He just had to rattle them off at the end because he was out of time. I'm out of time. So I'll just give you the last one real quick. All right. You said, yeah, right. It's God's will for you to rejoice. It's God's will for you to pray. And it is God's will for you to give thanks, not just on Thanksgiving, but all the time. Verse 18 Read it with me, good and strong, off the screen. Would you read it with me, please? In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In every situation, no matter what happens, give Him thanks. How many of you are thankful for your salvation? Anybody out there? How how many of you, I've asked you this before, how many of you had more clothes to wear than you could have worn at one time? Anybody have them? How many, how many of you got more than one set of clothes? Anybody out there? All right. I open. I, I start to say, how many of you are glad you had clothes to wear today? And I said, please raise your hand. Amen. Praise God. How many of you had more food to eat than you could have eaten at one time? Anybody out there? Are, isn't, is God good to us? How many of you woke up in your right mind? I'm being serious. How many of you woke up in your right mind? Is that not a gift from God? But the biggest thing, how many of you have your name in the Lamb's book of life? Let's thank Him for that one right now. Amen. Amen. Don't rejoice that the demons tremble when you speak my name, Jesus said to His disciples. But you rejoice that your names are written down in heaven. It's in Luke chapter 10. The night before he died, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house there are many mansions, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you unto myself. And here's what is the most beautiful thing about heaven. So that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? I can hear Jesus saying, 
Oh, thank you for setting this up. Thank you, Thomas. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father. You're not going to heaven unless you come through me. Aren't you glad you've got Jesus? Aren't you thankful for Jesus Christ? Let's give him praise right now. Amen. Don't, don't, don't tell me you don't have anything to be thankful for. You're just not looking around enough. I don't know about you. I don't know everything God wants you to do. I don't know everything God wants me to do. Sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I'm praying, I'm doing the best I can with what I've got. Amen? I, I don't, I don't, I'm just going off the last thing God said. I, I don't know, and sometimes I get it right, sometimes I get it wrong. Hopefully more I get it right than wrong. But I'll tell you this, you can go to the bank on this one. I know that it's God's will for you to rejoice. I know it's God's will for you to pray, and I know that it is God's will for you not to complain, but to give thanks. Amen. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. And I want to tell you one more time, if you don't know Jesus Christ, I know it is the will of God for you to be saved. Put back up on the screen one more time, 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. Let's all read it together. Here we go. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Would you bow your heads with me, please? As we conclude our services, we're about to have one more song of worship, but before we do that, would you, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, would you today just give him your life. Lay your life down on the altar and say, Lord, I want to repent of my sins. I want to turn to you. I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I want to have all my sins washed away. Oh, Lord Jesus, save me. Would you do that right now? Would you do that right now? I'd like to lead you in a prayer. That's how you, you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And I'd like to lead you in that prayer where you call upon him. Would you do that? Pray something like this. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me. I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. I believe you're the only Savior. Lord, with your help, I repent. I turn from my sin. I turn to you. I believe that you died on the cross. And you paid the penalty for my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe that you're alive. Oh, Jesus, I receive you right now. I call on your name. Please save me right now, Lord Jesus Christ. Wash me in your blood. Fill me with your spirit. Write my name in the book of life. And please help me to live for you the rest of my life. And when I die, take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, all you Christians, let's bow our heads one more time. I forgot. I want you to pray with me. I'm praying myself. You just pray there where you are. Let's tell the Lord that we want to do His will in these three areas, all right? Just say something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, help me to rejoice. Fill me with your Spirit. And let the love and the joy and the peace of the Spirit flow through me. Help me to rejoice. And let people, when they're around me, sense the joy of the Lord that is my strength. And Lord, help me to pray 
Help me to pray prayers of praise. Help me to pray for forgiveness when I need that. Help me to pray prayers of surrender when I don't know what to do. Help me to pray prayers of protection. Help me to agree with you in prayer. Oh God, teach me to pray and help me to pray because that's your will. And then Lord, help me to give thanks. Help me, Lord, not to always just ask for things, but let me thank you for what you've given me. Let me count the blessings and thank you for them. Oh God, this is your will for me. Help me to do your will in Jesus' name. If that's your prayer, say amen.